screen if you would just speak up while the image is on the screen and not wait till the end of the program. Uh, that way we'll know what it is uh, that you were referring to and won't have to try to remember 30 minutes later. Can you all hear me in the back all right at this level of volume? Are the lights going to be low? Yes. It's okay? Okay. If you stop hearing me, let me know. So, something wrong with the title even. <laughs> yeah, it's the other kind of bear. And uh, there have been people in the past who had problems with spelling Tom Bear's name. We'll even see where it was misspelled once in an advertisement for his resort. And uh, another problem with the title, if I wanted to be more accurate, I would have said 200 mules because Tom Bear at one time had approximately that many mules for his pack trains. But I thought if I put that number down, you'd think that I was uh, kidding. And so I just came up with a more modest number. <laughs> well, let's find out what this all means. <coughs> There's Tom Bear. Um, forceful personality. Um, interesting man of the Wild West in many ways. And we're going to find out a little more about him. Uh, he was uh, born in Arkansas in 1840. Uh, by the time he was nine years old, both of his parents had died, and he came out to California with an uncle when he was 11, and spent some time in Shasta County. Uh, he went up into Idaho and worked uh, with pack trains there for a while, and then he came back uh, to California to Humboldt County, and we'll pick up his story there. But uh, midway through uh, the Tom Bear saga, we're going to devote some time, there's his pack mule. We're going to devote some time to Charlie Moon, who was uh, certainly his most famous associate in the uh, late 1800s and early 1900s. But we're going to start off with the pack trains. And uh, Tom, uh, at first, uh, did not own a pack train. He worked for a man by the name of Dayton Barnhart. And, uh, he had the job of riding the bell mare that went in front of the rest of the pack train. And that job was called being the bell boy. And it was usually a younger person like he was at the time. So he'd be up front riding this mare. And it had bells on it so that if anyone was coming the other way, they would hear the bells and realize that uh, here was a pack train coming and better get out of the way or better not come around the bend and expect that you're going to get your mules to back up because uh, most of these trails were very narrow and you had to be uh, careful about uh, where uh, different uh, teams and, and mules and uh, packers met. So it took a while to go, uh, go on these pack train trips from the Arcata area inland and every night where they camped, um, they would have dinner, and then Tom and Dayton would play poker. <laughs> and Tom was the better poker player, as it turned out, at least after a while. And uh, he wound up winning the pack train from Dayton, his boss. In fact, they say it occurred that it switched back and forth several times. But when we go to uh, one of the early censuses, uh, I think this is from uh, 1900. Tom Bear Jr. is listed here um, as the head of the household out at Redwood Creek. Uh, Tom Bear Sr. apparently was spending more time in Arcata by then. But, so there's Tom Bear Jr. He's head of the household. If you go down here a ways, there's Dayton Barnhart. He's listed as a servant. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, that's how uh, Tom Bear the first uh, got a leg up. In fact, you'll also see listed in the household down here. Here's uh, Charlie Moon, uh, and he is listed as the head of a household. Uh, he, he was working for the Bear family, but he also had a place of his own nearby where he and his wife Minnie and their children live. So let's take a look at what the pack train routes would have been in those early days when Tom Bear had a pack train. Uh, this map's from 1911, but it shows a lot of the old places on it, and uh, we'll uh, pretty much follow the route that he would have taken. So just to get your bearings, here's Arcata, here's Blue Lake, here is uh, Redwood Creek, 
And here is the corner of the Hoopa Reservation. And the, the route that Tom Bear traveled was to take supplies uh, that came up here by boat to Arcata, and he wanted to take them out to Hoopa because he had uh, the concession out there to run the store at the fort. And that was only granted to one person, uh, at least initially, and so he had a sort of monopoly on selling goods out there. So, coming up through Arcata, up the Mad River, going across Redwood Creek, and on into Hoopa. And there goes the mule. And it's accompanied by this poem uh, that W. Taylor Douglas wrote. That's just one couplet from it. Uh, he ran out of ways to rhyme valley, so he had to use it twice in four <laughs> sentences. But uh, anyway, uh, it's fairly accurate. Um, about seven miles uh, from the Bear Ranch to the Hoopa Valley and a little longer than that out to the coast. So here is a Tom Bear pack train out north of Arcata. We don't know the exact date. It's probably early 1900s. They are forming up now, uh, having uh, gotten their supplies in Arcata. This is out at Alliance, which is a couple of miles north of Arcata where he would start the road out to Blue Lake. And you can see that uh, they have a pretty good sized train here. A lot of times he had uh, maybe 50 pack mules uh, in a particular uh, train of the mules. Um, most pack mules could carry about 300 pounds. And so that's quite a bit. Uh, uh, when you multiply it times 50, you've got a pretty good load of supplies going out into the back country. Um, remember, they were supplying the different outposts back in the back country, miners, people like that. There's one story of a pack train up in uh, Del Norte County that went out to the mines, um, had 30 mules in it. And they got there, and one uh, mule had a load of sugar. And the other 29 mules were carrying whiskey. <laughs> and that was uh, the priority for some of these people uh, that uh, held true pretty often. There's a sad story out in Weaverville where they were snowed in one winter and uh, they started running out of food. And uh, they were desperate for food. And then uh, word came that a train of pack mules was coming from the Reading area trying to get through the snow to Weaverville. The people in Weaverville were so hungry that they actually dug out the trail for about 15 miles to get to the pack mules. Well, no one had told them what the mules were carrying, and it turned out it was all pig iron for the local blacksmith. <laughs> <laughs> so they had to wait till the next train came along before they actually got fed. But anyway, uh, this is near the starting point. There's our mule again. They're going to uh, head out. They're going to go through Blue Lake. Now, here's a competitor. Uh, this is a pack train from Brizard and Company, and this is Brizard's Emporium out in Blue Lake. They started off with the big store in the Jacoby Storehouse in Arcata, and uh, they branched out and had a number of stores in the back country, and eventually uh, they opened one in Blue Lake, and that meant that they could carry their supplies by train on the Arcata and Mad River Railroad. Here's the tracks out as far as Blue Lake, and then form their pack trains from there and go out to serve, oh, several stores uh, that Brizard and Company had in the back country, like at Witchpeck and Orleans and Denny, places like that. Um, you notice that the mules are raring to go. Um, this man here, rather dark complected, probably came from Chile. Um, when the Brizards were on their way to California, they came around uh, <coughs> by boat, and they stopped in South America and spent some time there. And while they were there, they noticed that there was a packing trade going up in the Andes Mountains, and uh, that the packers were really good at what they did. So when Brizard wanted <coughs> to start his pack trains, he sent back to Chile and Peru, and he got some of the packers from there to come out and uh, actually run his trains. So for a number of years, uh, most of uh, his uh, workers uh, needed the equivalent of a green card, which they didn't have in those days, but they provided a level of expertise that they uh, wouldn't have had otherwise. One of his Chilean packers was Urbano Bibancos. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's right. 
And uh, he stayed here, I believe. And does he still have uh, descendants living in the area? I don't know. Okay. Jerry, what was the time frame of that photo? <clears throat> uh, that would be before 1909, uh, but probably <coughs> early 1900s. The reason why we know that is that in 1909, Broussard rebuilt his building and turned it 90 degrees so that the uh, front of it faced uh, this street across from the Logger Bar. Is that building still there? Doesn't look like that. The Broussard Emporium is there, uh, but it's much bigger than in this picture and has a new facade on it. So if you go into Blue Lake and you stand out in front of the Logger Bar or if you go next <coughs> to the Grange Hall, and look across the street, you'll see a big white building with display windows in front, right next to the, the railroad, but now it's just the, the corner of the building that was over here has turned and facing the bar across the street. Uh, it hasn't operated as an emporium for I don't know how long, but I believe it's used uh, as rentals for uh, people who live there now. So, uh, there are several routes to get out to the Hooper area, but one that Broussard used, and I think uh, Tom Bear used at least part of the time, was to go from Blue Lake out through Corbell and climb up into the mountains, and instead of going out to Maple Creek where the main road is, you would make a left turn and go through the Angel Ranch and come to this junction at a spot called Bald Mountain. This is Bald Mountain, and it still has some trees on one side of it, but if you see it, from the east, the whole side is prairie and kind of bare. And in fact, the Rizard and Company actually maintained a building here and corrals for their mules, and it was kind of a stopover place. But uh, that would be a major journey just to get up there from the Blue Lake area, because you had a very steep hill to climb and a number of miles to travel. Uh, and here comes the mule down the old trail, and he's doing okay. He's part of a uh, Tom Bear's string of mules, so he wouldn't have stopped there. Went out to the um, north from there, uh, about to where um, Lord Ellis Summit is. And then you would make a turn and head uh, down into the Redwood Creek Valley uh, on a slightly different route than you have today. But uh, you could uh, certainly uh, approximate it as you took the road into Redwood Creek. And this, in 1902, is what the Bear Ranch looked like down at the bottom of uh, that, would have been a trail in those days and later a road uh, that came from Bald Mountain. Um, the ranch was on the east side of uh, Redwood Creek. Uh, there was a bridge that went across the creek there and uh, there was a stopover place. Uh, it was, uh, for one thing, uh, it was far enough away that you would certainly need to rest there and stay overnight. Secondly, you had made it down to the bottom of the valley and the next leg of the trip was going to be going steeply uphill and you wouldn't want to do that with tired mules. So people stayed overnight here. Uh, way back in the 1860s, it was owned, uh, the ranch that was there at that location was owned by Isaac Miner. Uh, the fellow that built the Minor Theater and has the huge uh, tomb at the Greenwood Cemetery. And uh, we'll tell you a little more about what happened to Minor and how Tom Bear uh, came to take over that property. But uh, if you left the Bear Ranch, which is down in the valley, this is the uh, valley of Redwood Creek, and Lord Ellis Summit would be up on this ridge over here. You can take uh, what used to be the pack train trail, but in the 1910s was converted to a road, Bear Road is its name, uh, after Tom Bear, and take that all the way over to Hoopa, going over the summit at a place called Greasewood Swag. And once again, there's the mule on his way. But remember, he's freshly rested now because he spent the night at the Bear Ranch. And then finally, after you uh, crossed the divide and uh, went uh, downhill for about five or six miles, you wound up in Hoopa where Tom Bear had his store. And we don't know if these are Bear's mules, but you can see they're carrying pretty good loads. Um, so you might wonder, what if you had an object that weighed more than 300 pounds, uh, more than the average mule would carry? 
Well, they had different ways of dealing with that. Sometimes they could kind of put two mules together and using some boards that were attached to their pack frames, they could split the load uh, between a couple of mules. That didn't work in a lot of situations because uh, those trails were narrow and winding and you couldn't have something that was 20 feet long negotiating <coughs> the curves. So a lot of times they had to find a mule that had taken steroids or the equipment <laughs> that was especially strong and they would strap a very large load onto this poor single mule. There was one mule that actually carried a pump organ into Orleans on these trails. But my favorite is the mule that had to carry a cast iron bathtub up to the mining town of Getty. And so it weighed a lot, also it was an awkward object. So they built a kind of special frame and uh, put that on the mule. Then they turned the bathtub upside down and put it on the frame and it also engulfed the mule. So the mule could not see ahead. All he could see was the trail in front of him. And that mule made it up on the, this very narrow and dangerous uh, trail all the way up to Denny and he got within about uh, 300 feet of the house where he was going to deliver the uh, bathtub and there was a tree that had a low overhanging limb and it knocked the uh, bathtub off of the mule. So he almost made a perfect trip and by that time they were close enough that the family could just carry the bathtub in the rest of the way. <laughs> I just have to tell you one more, mules are pretty prominent. Remember I'm promising you at least 50 in here. I've got to tell you one more story about mules. Uh, this didn't take place in California. It took place in uh, the Cascade Mountains in uh, Washington State, not far from Mount Rainier, where they used to do a lot of coal mining. And, uh, you know, the tunnels in coal mines were kind of cramped, uh, small space to work in, and a lot of times mules were um, used to pull these carts out that were filled with coal. Uh, eventually they would start using small locomotives, small steam engines to do that. But in the early days, a uh, mule would uh, go back into the tunnel and they had these little carts and the carts had couplings on them like rail cars did. And so the mule was hitched to the first cart and they'd load it up with coal and then they'd bring in another cart and slam it into the coupling so they'd lock and the mule would hear that and they would then fill up a second uh, car. And they do that again with the third car. So now the mules heard that clanging twice and felt the jolt. And they did it with the fourth car. And that was a standard load. And the mules were fine with that. And then they'd start walking out and pulling the load out of the tunnel. But sometimes the miners would think that they could uh, sneak something by these mules. And so they would try adding a fifth car, which meant another clank. And mules, now this is proof those mules could count at least to four because when they heard that fourth clank, they sat down and refused to pull the load and remove the car. So, you know, I've taught students who had trouble counting up to four because the mules could, uh, could do it on their own and you shudder to think what would happen if they ever unionized because it would have been quite a sight. And once again, we've got this particular mule um, showing up there at the end of the pack tree. Well, so Tom Bear um, finds out that uh, the miner's ranch is available. Uh, actually, miner's ranch house had been burned. And uh, it turned out that miner didn't want any part of it again. And so Tom was able to buy the property. But let's look at that and see what happened. So this is an 1865 map of Humboldt County, uh, the northern end of Humboldt County. Here's Arcata. Here's the county line. We're talking 1863, where everything north of School Road and McKinleyville, everything north of that was part of Klamath County. And if you haven't heard of Klamath County, I don't blame you because no one's heard of it really since 1876. It was the only county ever to be disincorporated by the legislature. They were bankrupt. They owed thousands of dollars. Their county seat was in Orleans, and the only way you could get there was by pack train trail. They were the only county seat in the state that didn't have a road anywhere in the county. People in Orleans would 
wait until their children were old enough to appreciate things. They'd bring them to the coast and show them a road so that they would know what one looked like. <laughs> then they'd take them back by packing the little train and take them to a place where there were no roads. So the uh, mules were especially important to that area. And uh, even in 1863, Klamath County was struggling along. Uh, there were more difficulties than just the trail because now we were involved in a period of time when uh, the, what were sometimes called the mountain Indians, the Indians who lived not right on the coast, but between the coast and the Trinity and Klamath River, were involved in a prolonged conflict uh, with the whites. Remember, all of that area had been Indian country up until 1850, and then all of a sudden, a whole bunch of white people land on Humboldt Bay, they establish these little towns, they take over the Indian trails, turn them into pack train trails. Uh, they shoot the elk and deer uh, in great quantities. They don't sustain the population like the local Indians had, who were careful not to kill more than would come back in time. Uh, they then take over the prairies where the elk and deer have been grazing and turn them into cattle ranches. Uh, they would chase Indians around. They would sometimes shoot Indians on sight. Uh, they would take Indian women and force them to cohabitate with the whites. Uh, they would steal Indian children and sell them in the Central Valley as slaves. So that only went on so long before the Indians finally, uh, with great provocation, decided that they would fight back. And the groups that fought the hardest were these Indians uh, in the Redwood Valley and Trinity Valley, Trinity River Valley, places like that. They were tribes like the Hoopa, the Sinungwe, the Chimerico, the Wilkut, uh, the group that's called the Cholula sometimes, which is sort of a northern connection to the Wilkut tribe, the Mawanoc Indians down on Mad River. All of these people were trying to prevent the coast from continuing its connections to the back country. And they were very successful at this for a number of years. It's the kind of thing that later would be called guerrilla warfare. Uh, it was the thing that has proven so successful in certain countries like Vietnam, where a group of people uh, fighting there in their homeland are able to successfully um, affect the outcome of a conflict with a much more powerful, larger nation. So here's the pack train trail again that's going out towards Hoopa from the valley. And here are ranches that were out in the Bald Hills and the Redwood Creek Valley, uh, strung out many places. What I've circled right there says Miner and Seth. I'm not sure who Seth was. I think it's a, it might uh, be a misspelling. And uh, that would be where Miner's ranch was on uh, Redwood Creek, right where the pack train trail crossed. Well, to try to protect the ranches and to keep the trails open, uh, the military created a number of camps in the back country staffed with soldiers. And they uh, built one about two miles away, mile and a half, two miles away from Miner's Ranch. There's a, that's going to serve as Miner's Ranch. And there was Camp Anderson. Uh, the problem was that you just had a few of these camps. And they were often miles apart from the next one. And so each camp had a wide territory to cover. And uh, the Indians, if they wanted to interdict a supply train, if they wanted to steal the mail, if they wanted to uh, disrupt uh, the trails, they could pick and choose their spot, making sure they were far enough away from one of these camps or where the detachment of soldiers were that they could escape before the soldiers came and uh, tried to fight them. So the Indians uh, became very successful at the, this. Uh, of course, they had the support of the local Indians. At uh, one time, there were about four groups of Indians fighting uh, in the back country. They each had about 15 to 20 uh, men in each group. If things got really difficult, they could actually go into Trinity County and hide at the caves at Del Loma uh, above the Trinity River. So they were uh, very successful, and they reached a high point in 1863. Here's the mule, and it could only get through sometimes because uh, 
uh, the trails could be closed by the Indians, at least temporarily, and uh, a lot of times you had to have a military guard escorting the packers as they went into the back country. So then uh, these ranches were attacked, and uh, uh, often uh, people were not killed in the attacks, but the ranchers were driven off or they fled beforehand. Then the Indians would come in and take uh, the cattle. Uh, remember, they don't have a good food supply anymore because the whites have hunted the elk and the bald hills to extinction. And uh, then the ranch houses and the barns would be burned. And uh, in this case, the Wilcott Indians would be in Redwood Creek and uh, blocking this area. Here's Isaac Miner out at his ranch, and while he's out there, as he uh, watches, these ranches are attacked and burned. And uh, before they get to Miner's place, he heads very quickly for <laughs> Arcata and left his ranch. And then his ranch was attacked and burned, and it was the last ranch standing. So the entire Bald Hills and Redwood Creek area no longer had a single ranch in it. Uh, the Indians had driven off the ranchers, they had burned the ranches, they pretty much shut down the connection between uh, the Arcata area, the Eureka area, and the back country. I won't go into great detail about this, but the following year, in 1864, uh, the whites, the military, uh, decided that they could not successfully win this war, and so they negotiated with the Indians, and uh, they made an offer finally. And the offer was to establish a reservation at Hoopa. And uh, once that offer was presented to the Indians and the terms worked out, those bands of guerrilla warriors came in and they signed the agreement, and the government signed the agreement in 1864. And as part of that agreement, the Hooper Reservation was established, 12 miles on each side, 144 mi square miles total. So a large uh, piece of land for a reservation that included most of the Hoopa tribe's homeland. Uh, the other tribes that were outside of the reservation that had been fighting uh, didn't fare quite as well as the Hoopas because they were required to move on to the reservation. So the Sanungways and the Wilcoots, Cholula people, uh, moved on to the reservation, at least for a time. But to my knowledge, this was the only instance of a, a situation where the United States government actually compromised with a group of Indians, and out of that compromise uh, formed a reservation that uh, the Indians had had a say in determining. In other cases, the reservations were pretty much forced down the Indians' throat. There's Isaac Miner. He you know, fled to Arcata. Uh, he's out at his rock quarry, which is uh, between Fickle Hill Road and uh, Blue Lake. And he actually quarried a lot of rock there and had a rail line that went up to the quarry. And uh, in this particular case, he is inspecting uh, some big slabs of granite because uh, they are going to uh, be used for his huge tomb at Greenwood uh, Cemetery. So this is much later than the time uh, when he fled the Redwood Creek area, but because he fled in a timely manner, he remained alive until old age. Well, here we are probably in the 1910s looking at the property that Tom Bear took over from Miner. Remember, Miner's house was burned in 1863 in the buildings. New buildings were built. Uh, the next ranch house burned in 1911, and then this building was built after that time. And uh, by then, it had become not just a stopping place for the packers and the mail carriers and people like that. It had become a resort. Mm -hmm. And uh, here is a uh, sort of advertisement where uh, they can't spell Tom Bear's <laughs> name right. Uh, remember, this Bear, I think, is paying for this ad. And you think that they would have proofread it a little more closely. But uh, they're talking about the Commodious Hotel building here. Uh, and he had some special um, yeah. offers to people that they could provide uh, for the uh, folks who wanted an enhanced vacation, who didn't want to just you know, stay there and loaf. 
if you were a fisherman or if you were a hunter, in this case, uh, they could have an expert hunter, uh, Mr. Fernal, with his best pack of uh, hound dogs and uh, go out and probably, uh, if not uh, uh, being able to bag a bear, B-E-A-R, uh, they could at least uh, get a deer or some other large animal. Can, on that picture just back one, can you give us the orientation? What direction are we looking? Well, this is Redwood Creek, okay. I believe, here. And the uh, house was on, is on the left of the east side of Redwood Creek. East so side. so okay. this would be looking south up the creek. Okay. Uh, Lord Ellis Summit would be up here, if I'm correct, and Barry Summit would be back up here. Huh. Okay. So you can see a very large place, nicely done, rustic but uh, commodious. And look at the interior, the beautiful rock work, uh, probably more than one local Indian basket, another one here, I think. Um, so this was a place that people would certainly look forward to going to, uh, the place where you could honeymoon. It was a, a place where you could hunt and fish. Um, remember that uh, in those days, people were very desirous of, uh, say, leaving Southern California or the cities when times grew hot in the summer, and you could come out here and enjoy the fresh air, uh, be near the creek. And so it uh, proved, I think, to be a very popular spot. Well, so one of the people that was with Tom Bear out at Redwood Creek was a uh, Chinese man by the name of Charlie Moon. And uh, this is the uh, Bear's tomb, Tom Bear's tomb in uh, Greenwood Cemetery. A lot smaller than Isaac Miner's, but he was at a disadvantage. He didn't own his own rock quarry, so he had to uh, pay for the rock used in this. Well, nearby, in fact, right next to Isaac Miner's tomb are, is the joint grave for Tom Bear's son, Tom Bear Jr., and Tom Bear Jr.'s wife, uh, uh, Beatrice Carr uh, Bear. And uh, they both died very early in 1913. Uh, Tom Bear II was in his early 30s. Um, he was in a hospital and what uh, the problem was, but it was very serious and he was uh, in critical condition. His wife went down there to be with him and while she was down there, even though she was 30 years old, she had a heart attack and died. And then uh, six weeks later, I believe it was, uh, Tom Bear Jr. died, which meant that Tom Bear III, their son, was an orphan. Uh, and uh, he spent some time with his grandmother near the coast, but he spent part of the time out at the Bear Ranches. And the person that uh, kind of took charge of him was uh, this worker uh, for Tom Bear, Charlie Moon. And you'll see that uh, when Charlie was uh, out there dealing with uh, the Bear Ranch and the Bear grandson, um, he was coming out of a very difficult time period in Humboldt County history. In 1885, almost all of the Chinese people in Humboldt County were driven out, uh, forced to leave, not paid uh, for any property they had to give up, anything like that, made to feel they were lucky to uh, escape with their lives. And here in 1890, the Humboldt County Directory is taking great pride in telling everyone that Humboldt County is the only county in the state containing no Chinamen. So let's look at what happens. Um, so we're in the 1880s. Remember back in the late 1860s, early 1870s, a lot of Chinese workers were building railroads. And uh, some of them came up here and actually worked on some railroads and also on wagon roads. Uh, they were responsible for building a good part of the first wagon road that left Humboldt County and went down to uh, San Francisco Bay. They were working out by Blocksburg and Ridgeville <coughs> building the road there. They also uh, built the road that connected Shelter Cove from Garberville. And they finished that road in about 1880 down Garberville. And uh, the folks down there uh, showed their prejudice by anticipating what happened later in Eureka. 
They drove out all of the Chinese people from southern Humboldt County in about 1881. So now we're at 1885, and there is this frenzy that's sweeping the western part of the country where uh, the Chinese are no longer valued as workers. They're seen as competitors, uh, people who can do uh, the work cheaper and better than uh, certain whites. And uh, there's a move to restrict immigration to prevent more Chinese from coming into the country, and then a uh, desire to drive the Chinese out of some of these communities. We're here at the intersection, excuse me, of 4th, this is 4th, and this is E Street. And right here is where Edward Jones has his office now. If you look down on the south side of 4th Street, you see these very small buildings. This block was known as Chinatown up until 1885. And here's a map that shows that. So to get your bearings, here's 4th Street, here's E, here's F. And so this uh, northern half of the block uh, bounded by 4th Street, even here it's called Chinatown, with these very small houses that the people lived in. Casper uh, Ricks was the owner of that block. And right there at the corner, here is a, a Chinese man uh, carrying uh, something, maybe laundry, uh, and uh, he is standing uh, right in front of where Edward Jones would be today. So uh, there are some Chinese gamblers up here, and they form different factions, and they fight among themselves. And one evening, um, a couple of them got in a gunfight right here at this intersection at a time when some white people were walking by, including one of the city councilmen, a man named, by, uh, named Kendall, and a stray bullet uh, hit a, uh, a boy and wounded him, and then another bullet hit and killed uh, Kendall. And uh, with uh, a very strong anti-Chinese sentiment already present in Eureka, this was like uh, lighting a match to the tinder. And within hours, let me show you here. So there's the Chinatown area. Within hours, there was a, after the shooting here at 4th and E, there was a uh, meeting convened in Centennial <coughs> Hall over in the block in the back of the uh, Arkley Theater. And uh, there were two factions. And over a thousand whites showed up, all angry. One faction said, well, we should just kill all the Chinese right now. We get it over with. And there was a more moderate group that, says, that said no, um, but uh, we should just get rid of them. We should force them to leave. Those are the only two options discussed by this group. And uh, the moderate group prevailed, and uh, it was decided that they would give the Chinese 24 hours to gather their possessions, and then they would uh, have to leave by ship. And that, in fact, happened with all of the Chinese people leaving that abruptly people at least who are in Eureka. So Eureka has removed its Chinese population. Other towns like Ferndale and Arcata followed soon afterward. As I said, Garberville had already uh, removed the Chinese people from southern Humboldt. But there were still some Chinese people around out uh, beyond the reach of the vigilantes on the coast. Uh, there were some up on the Klamath River working as miners. Uh, there was at least one a Chinese man working as a cook in Hoopa, and then on the Bear Ranch there was Charlie Moon. And there they go. There's Charlie, uh, maybe in the middle of his life. He had come over uh, with his brother and some other people from China. Uh, he was just a kid at the time. Uh, they landed at Humboldt Bay, and uh, his brother and the other men uh, we're going to go out and work in the gold country. But Charlie was not old enough, they felt, to go out and do heavy work, so they left him in Arcata. And he had to make a living, and he got a job for a while, uh, kind of scavenging uh, houses that had been burned or destroyed and collecting useful material from that. But then uh, Tom Bear found out about Charlie and uh, actually took Charlie on as a worker. And over time, Charlie learned how to do certain things, and he also had a kind of innate skill at certain things, and he became an invaluable uh, member of the Bear extended family. And there's Tom, once again. 
uh, rather stern looking man, uh, and as it turned out, that uh, proved a benefit to Charlie. Uh, because it was known that there were people like Charlie and a couple of other um, uh, Chinese people living out in the back country. Uh, in fact, there had already been uh, one family uh, that was part Chinese and part Yurok, the Ames family, up uh, uh, near Wichpec. And a man by the name of Jackson Ames, the next generation, was half Yurok, half Chinese. But uh, the person that attracted the most attention people out on the coast was Charlie Moon. So, one day a couple of uh, white vigilantes ride out to the uh, Bear Ranch in Redwood Creek and uh, they uh, tell Tom Bear, uh, who met them out in the yard, that they wanted to take Charlie Boom back with them and uh, send him out of the county. And Tom uh, said, nope, not going to let you do it. And so I think they swore at Tom a little and they rode off. Well, a little while later, they came back. And uh, there's a group like this, maybe even a couple more. And uh, this time, uh, Tom met them on uh, the porch of his ranch. And in his arm, he uh, was cradling a Winchester rifle. And one of the whites said, we want that chink. And Tom showed them the rifle, and he said, there's 13 bullets in this rifle, and you might get me, but I'll get a few of you before you do. And he says, I'm not the only person on this ranch with a rifle who knows how to use it. And he sort of looked around at the other buildings, and these guys started getting a little nervous, realizing that they had uh, ridden into an ambush. So uh, there was some more fist shaking, some more swearing, and then these fellows rode back to um, Eureka, uh, what I called a moonless night. <laughs> and uh, Charlie stayed out there with Tom. And to my knowledge, they were never bothered again with uh, this sort of attempt. Um, so in relative peace, uh, Charlie managed to uh, get on with his life. Um, north of uh, the Bear Ranch House was the site of this Camp Anderson that I told you about that uh, didn't help too much during the Indian white conflict. And very close to the uh, fort, uh, in fact, almost next to the fort's uh, graveyard, was a parcel of land that Charlie and his wife, Minnie, uh, took over. And it is still in the family. And if you drive out there today, you will see this building with Redwood Creek behind it uh, down in the valley. And uh, it's the lasting legacy of the Moon family. So that property belonged to Charlie and his wife. Charlie would work at the Bear Ranch, and according to uh, information from Tom Bear the Third, um, he uh, would leave every day and go home at four o'clock in the afternoon and cook his wife Minnie her dinner. And but he'd go back and he'd continue working for uh, the Bear family. Well, Tom Bear III was the, the little kid who was left as an orphan when his parents both died in 1913. Charlie had taken care of Tom as he grew up, Tom III. He'd also uh, taken care of Tom II and his brother Fred because Tom Bear's uh, first wife had died young and uh, left those two uh, sons as uh, youngsters. So Charlie had taken care of two generations of the Bear family. And one of the things that Tom Bear told those vigilantes was that Charlie had been like a mother to my kids, and he was not going to let them take that person away. So Tom Bear III, uh, many years later, wrote a short account about his memories of uh, Charlie. And uh, one thing that really stuck in my mind was uh, this episode where Charlie cleaned the cat. And Tom, uh, Tom Bear III said that uh, Charlie uh, always had a plan for dealing with any problem, but sometimes the plans were kind of unorthodox. <laughs> and in this case, there was a semi-feral cat hanging around uh, during salmon season. It would go down to Redwood Creek and it would find a, a salmon that had 
expired, and like nothing better than to kind of rub it against the, what's left of the salmon, and then come back smelling really bad. And so uh, everyone wanted to solve this problem, not having this stinky cat around. Well, there's the cat. Remember, semi-feral. Not a friendly cat, right? Not one you really want to mess with. And no one else could figure out, it's not like you're going to go up and say, kitty, kitty, and it's going to purr, and you're going to be able to scrub it, right? Well, Charlie decided that the cat was one of three things you needed. You also needed a bar of soap, uh -oh. and you needed a burlap sack. First thing Charlie did, he managed to get all three of those objects close together, and he dropped the soap into the sack. Then, he grabbed the cat, dropped it into the sack, and tied the end of the sack shut. Then, there's the cat and the soap in there now, right? He goes down to Redwood Creek. This is the creek right next to the bridge. He's got his sack, drops it into the creek, shakes it, until suds start coming out, brings it out, opens it up, the cat comes out, runs away, uh, stays away for two days, but next time they see it, it smells wonderful. <laughs> smells of soap. So, if you're, you know, faced with that problem, maybe your cat gets skunked or something, let me suggest that this foolproof method to you. Okay. So Charlie stayed in Humboldt County to the end of his life. Eventually he came out and spent the, his last years out on the coast. And when he died in the 1940s, um, he was considered to be the only uh, person of Chinese extraction to be living in Humboldt County. Uh, the county had vigilantly enforced its code and refused to allow any other Asians, not just Chinese people, but uh, Japanese and I believe Korean if they'd been trying to come here, uh, they had uh, kept them out. Uh, by then, the other uh, Chinese men who were, lived out on the Klamath and Trinity Rivers had passed away, and so Charlie, uh, in his 80s, 83 years old, was indeed the, uh, the last person uh, Chinese extraction to live in the county. Um, the, like I said, uh, the whites were vigilant about this sort of thing. In the 1920s, a, uh, 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 some members of the Japanese uh, consulate in San Francisco drove up the Redwood Highway and stopped in Fortuna and went to a hotel and registered. And the hotel clerk immediately got in touch with the uh, Fortuna chief of police who came over and, according to a newspaper article, explained to these uh, Japanese gentlemen uh, what Humboldt's County attitude was towards Asians. And when he uh, told them about it, they immediately left and went out. So we can imagine uh, what he might have said to uh, get them to leave. Then in the 1930s, an even more spectacular event occurred when uh, down in Garberville, a uh, motorcade of several very fancy autos uh, came up the Redwood Highway and just north of Garberville where the highway dropped down in the old days to cross uh, Bear Gulch on a beautiful bridge. Um, several cars drove up San Francisco and uh, he had a major operation and uh, I haven't found an account yet that said stopped in the middle of the bridge came out and barricaded the bridge. And a couple of minutes later, uh, here comes this cavalcade of motorists. They have to stop. It turns out it's the Japanese ambassador from Washington, D.C., and his assistant, and some State Department officials who are making a tour of the West Coast. And uh, word had gotten out somehow that they were about to enter Humboldt County, and so this modern-day group of vigilantes got there. They were armed with guns. They stopped the group. At first, they were going to force them to turn around and go back, even though there were members of uh, the United States government State Department present. Uh, they wouldn't listen to any of that. Finally, they agreed to allow the cavalcade to con continue through Humboldt County onto the north, so long as the Japanese agreed not to leave the cars until they left the county. And that was as late as the 1930s. A few years before that, um, how many of you are familiar with the Hartsook Inn, or what used to be Hartsook Inn? 
Well, Fred Hartsick was building his inn down there uh, near Richardson Grove in the early 20s, and uh, he employed some Chinese, brought some Chinese people in to work for him, and uh, the locals uh, went and told Fred that that was not allowed. That he was not allowed to bring Chinese workers in, and uh, at first Fred said, pretty much the hell with you, I'm going to do it anyway, and so he kept them on until his uh, inn mysteriously burned down due to arson. And uh, he rebuilt, but he'd gotten the message, and then he no longer had Chinese workers. So even up in the 20s and 30s, this was being enforced here in Humboldt County. So when uh, Charlie passed away in 43, indeed, it appeared there were no Asians up here at all. And only when uh, Ben Chin got out of the U.S. Army after World War II and came up here with his wife and started Chin's Restaurant here in Eureka did we finally have uh, another Asian family come up here. And uh, Ben uh, reported that he faced death threats, telephone calls, a number of things for several years. But uh, that kind of established the beachhead so that other uh, Asian families would come up here and, of course, eventually Asian students at HSU. But it was that late, it was the late 1940s before yeah. Humboldt County finally uh, uh, received uh, some uh, a new group of Asians. Okay, so Tom Bear had a career as a businessman. And uh, one of the things was uh, he was president of the Bank of Arcata. And if that doesn't look familiar, any of that, it's because it's all gone. That's the west side of the plaza in Arcata. And boy, has that undergone a facelift. There was a store on one side, a saloon on the other, and this bank. And just to show you where it is, here's Tom Bear. He's the president. He's also on the board of directors. Uh, Broussard is there, one of the Bull family. Uh, Spring, who had a shingle mill out by Sunny Bray. Uh, so there are a number of uh, leading residents of the Arcata area who were uh, active with this bank and lent their prestige and uh, some of their capital to that bank operating. And to show you where it was, we're looking here with north up here, and there's the bank. No longer there, but certainly an impressive building. We wish if it had stayed in place, it would sort of be the equivalent of the Clark Museum in Eureka. But Arcata wow. uh, didn't keep some of its old buildings there in the plaza. Well, Tom also got involved in some other operations. And one of them harkened back to the days when he had his own pack train and uh, went out to the Hoopa area. And you saw that picture of Tom. And you now know that he was handy with a Winchester. And <laughs> according to uh, a family story, uh, he was on the pack train trail once, and a couple of desperados held him up. Um, you know, rural area. Uh, he apparently was uh, by himself. Must have been a small train. And uh, according to the uh, the report, they said, well, some gunplay followed, and it didn't turn out well for the robbers. And you can um, read what you want into that. But we found out a little more about it later because Tom Bear was one of the founders of the original trolley company in Eureka. In fact, this is on 2nd Street in Eureka, about where Living Styles is today, where they had the uh, headquarters for the horse-drawn trolley. So the first two horses they bought to pull one of the trolley cars were named by Tom. And I'm not sure the names, but these might have been the names. And someone asked him about that. It turned out these were the names of the two guys that had tried to hold him up on the trail that he had shot and killed. And he commemorated them by naming his horses after them. So you have, to, you have to appreciate a guy with that sense of humor. Although you wouldn't want to be on the receiving end of it. So Mike and Maurice worked for a while. Then, they decided to switch from horse-drawn trolleys to an electric uh, system. But they needed additional power to do that. And there's Tom out on the trail, shooting both Maurice and Mike. <laughs> and he's going away. And the horse-drawn trailers are, are trolley replaced by the electric cars. This is out by Sequoia Park, uh, where one of the trolley lines went. 
But remember, now they've electrified, they have to have power. So to supply power, they built a system that started up in the Canyon Creek Lakes in Trinity County. And uh, not at the lakes itself, but a little ways down the canyon, they diverted some of the lake water from Canyon Creek uh, into a flume. They kept it high on the hillside, almost all the way down to uh, Junction City. And a mile or so before it got to Junction City, uh, they dropped it down the far side of the canyon uh, at a high rate of speed because it was elevated and it turned the turbines of this powerhouse. This is the Trinity River back here and Junction City would be over near me and Highway 299 would have gone here a little later. So this was the uh, power source for the North Mountain Power Company and they ran a line from there by Junction City all the way over to Eureka. Remember, that's a pretty rugged route. Mm -hmm. Here we are out at the Palm Bear Ranch that he had by Maple Creek, and the power line went right through the ranch. All of those pink areas, this anything that's pink or kind of pinkish orange, was part of the Bear Ranch. And here's the power line. It says North Mountain Power Company line. And uh, it continued on. It went uh, right by the town of uh, Freshwater. Uh, high voltage, in fact, in later years, <coughs> excuse me, the Pacific Lumber Company was logging out in fresh water, and they could get so much power from this line that they actually brought in a couple of electric-powered um, yarding uh, cars rather than using steam donkeys. And uh, they uh, would actually power, uh, provide enough power to move large logs around. The residents said that it took up so much power that the lights in fresh water would dim when they were using one of these. But anyway, they made use of that. But then finally, it got to this building uh, in Eureka, the North Mountain Power Company. Now, if that looks somewhat familiar to you, it is because it's now the Blue Ox Millworks. And uh, notice it's got that gable down at the end. Let's go back and take a look. There's the gable, right? Uh -huh. There's the gable, and if you don't believe me, if you think I'm just pulling your leg on this, go down and look, look up close, and you will see NMP Company, North Mountain Power Company, 1904, not once, but twice, <laughs> and uh, so that was their power source then that uh, allowed them to replace Maurice and Mike and the other horses. And you wonder what the other horses' names were and if they were named after other people that Tom shot. We don't know. <laughs> uh, so Tom then can move into a more luxuriant period of his life where he uh, realizes some of the fruits of his labor. And uh, he had had two different houses in Arcata, and both of them are well-known pieces of architecture. One of them um, was shown in Elliott's 1881 History of Humboldt County. Here it is. It's known today uh, more commonly as the Chapman House, right across the street from where uh, Dan Hauser lives. This house was re re recently bought by Rich Hunt and his wife, and they've turned it into a rather fancy B&B, &B, refurbished it, and this is while it was in progress. So that was uh, Tom Bear's house number one. Uh, then he moved up the hillside to the crest of uh, the hill north of Arcata, into this beautiful Victorian, uh, which is still there, and uh, which was the Bear Stokes house. The Stokes family took it over and they owned it when I uh, took this photo in 1991. And sure enough, still a little mule traffic because it's a bear house. And nowadays, uh, it looks like this. I actually preferred the other. Those are the two that are readily available that I use for my middle age and then late in life. But, you know, Charlie was, you know, he was more public. So he had a chance to picture him. Oh, that's what's going on. I'm sorry to say I don't know. Yes. Can I talk about the third, the, uh, third and fourth generation? Yeah. I'm Jeremiah Scott. I was president of the Historical Society back in the 70s, and I'm a contributing editor of the magazine 
which I hope you all join the Historical Society. In 1950, I was 14 years old, and I went to the YMCA camp at Camp Ravencliff, about a mile downstream on the south fork of the Eel from Redway. And the, I, I went there as an assistant swimming instructor, teaching young boys in the YMCA camp to swim. And the main swimming instructor was Tom Bear the Fourth, <laughs> born wow. 1931 in Humboldt County, Eureka High graduate 1949. He was a student that just finished his sophomore year at San Jose State. He was studying police science. He wanted to be a policeman, and he, he was taking military ROTC, and that's just the time of the Korean War starting. And I kept track of Tom. I was with him for three weeks every day, every night I was with him. And he was a great guy. He had played baseball at Eureka High. He was probably five foot eight, 175 pounds, and left-handed. And he could have played baseball at Eureka High. He uh, graduated from San Jose State, was commissioned an army officer in 53 went to Europe, I, I'm not sure what branch of the army he was in, got out, became a police officer in the San Jose, San Francisco area, and the last I heard of him was about 1970, and he owned a bar in San Francisco. That's the fourth generation, Tom Bear. Now he had a younger sister, Mary Bear, that was two years ahead of me at Eureka High, class of 52. She became a school teacher, still is living, and she's retired in, re in uh, Reading. Tom Bear III, Tom Bear III, I believe was born in 1906, and he ended up owning all of the ranches. They also had a ranch at, at uh, Mad River, and I remember as a kid going onto the beach at Mad River to surf fish, and we had to go through the bear ranch, or the dairy ranch. Uh, I never met Tom Bear, the third generation, but he was a strong Democrat. And when Edmund G. Brown was elected governor in 1959, Governor Edmund Brown appointed Tom Bear manager of the California State Fair in Sacramento, and that's where he was. His wife remained, I think remained, in Mad River area, along the Mad River, west of Arcata, and she had two more daughters. And for 30 years, from 74 to 04, I was the attorney for the Humboldt Bay Harbor Recreation Conservation District. And one of our duties was to survey and monument the bay. And we were surveying and monument, uh, monumenting Bad River. And the, the, the uh, uh, mother and s two sisters of Tom Bear that I just described at San Jose State came to our Harbor District meetings because we were questioning where their tidal boundary was along Mad River. So I met those three ladies two or three times at meetings with them, and with them, and we had an engineer do the survey, and, and we resolved uh, the issue. But it's interesting, to my knowledge, I don't. Uh, I know that the, the wife of the third Tom Bear is deceased. I don't know where the two daughters are. But they're, they're, the daughter still resides, uh, the oldest daughter still resides in Reading. And the younger daughter is in McKinleyville. <laughs> there, there's one in McKinleyville? That's Becky. 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 Yeah. Oh. And I can't think of the, her husband's name, but he has a house moving business. It's Kerwitz. Oh, her Charles Kerwitz. Her her Kerwitz? Yeah. Her her it's Kerwitz. Her 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 She's Becky Kerwitz now. Yeah, okay, great. Thanks. Thank you. Martha Bear was the third daughter. Okay. Three. okay. And she's still, still oh, yes. living? She lives on the East Coast. East Coast. Okay, great. Could you so the bears still exist. Tom Bear the third used to transport Man River Annie mm -hmm. from Tidy City to arcade of, to doctor's appointments, I know. Oh. Well, it, and his ranch would have been right next to the old village of Hot Palika where uh, Mad River Annie lived. Yeah, right. right near the house, or fairly close to the house. Yeah. I didn't know that. The Tom Bear Ranch shop. The information is interesting. Well, uh, <coughs> I'm Tom Bear's third daughter. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
uh, Charlie Moon's granddaughter, or great granddaughter, and um, my son, uh, his father, his great grandpa was Tom Bear. So my oh, son wow. Tyler has Bear and Moon blood. Uh, we finally came together. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. There you go. Yeah. A question, sir. Yeah. What date was it that you said that the Japanese party was in Humboldt County? Uh, I don't recall exactly. It was early 1930s. Well, my mother, her first teaching job in 1941 was... I worked with you for years.